called this land home before the arrival of settlers, and in many cases, still call it home. With that, we acknowledge that we worship and live on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Attawandering, and the Wayback people, a territory covered by the Upper Canada Treaty.
Nine hundred 
thank you for setting us in communities for families to nurture our becoming, for friends who love us by choice, for companions at work who share our burdens and daily tasks, for strangers who welcome us into their midst, for people from other lands who call us to grow in understanding, for children who lighten our moments with the light, for the unborn who offer us hope for the future. We thank you for this day, for life, for one more day to live, for one more day to love, for opportunity and one more day to work for justice and peace. For neighbors and one more person to love and by whom be loved. For your grace and one more experience of your presence. For your promise to be with us, to be God, and to give salvation. For these and all blessings, we give you thanks, eternal and loving God, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Each of us has experienced many blessings. Each of us has given many blessings too. May the giving and receiving be a constant sign of God's grace in this congregation and beyond. Our offering will now be received.
mutual affection. And he encourages them versus the trouble he often tries to correct in his other letters. Most of his other letters are about, hey, eh, you're doing this. Or this wobble over here needs to be fixed this way. There's a certain love that he has for the Philippians that's just a little different. The letter of encouragement and of love. What's interesting about this passage is the lead up to it. The letters are always in sections, but this section is addressing particularly a squabble between two women. I do it right. No, I do it right. And they're strong leaders of the church. And what's interesting in the lectionary is we kind of skip out or over this part of it because it's superfluous in some measurement, right? It's just the address needs to the part of the letter. But what it is important to recognize is that this part of the letter is addressed to two women leaders in the early church. People who Paul has entrusted to take on the responsibility and leadership in Philippi. A reading from Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Who go out of their way to help one another? Who gather? 
gather together and who gather us in. Who celebrate one another and their achievements, not only their achievements, but their children's achievements, their grandchildren's achievements. Who celebrate the history and the things to come. This community who walks together on a journey. And this weekend, as we come together to remember and celebrate together, it's a time to remember and say what we're thankful for. To share those memories and say, remember when? To share a moment for the end of the year. To those who aren't joining us. Those we miss and wish to celebrate with us still and to celebrate the legacy that they have left. Paul in his tiny cell says rejoice. Rejoice again and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. How does he evoke celebration in a time of loneliness and despair? of uncertainty, when the only thing he can really predict is that inevitably this prison sentence will all lead to his death. Let us forget for a moment, he says, all the worry and trouble and strife to celebrate together. Joining together in bounty for that is what reminds us what it's all for. To find those things, whatever they are, that are worthy of being praised. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about some difficult subjects. We saw Greta and the climate change action and this stuff that's happening in creation. And we talked about the residential schools and the struggle of indigenous peoples and our efforts in reconciliation. But where is the peace and love that is shared? We are witness. We are witness to that compassion, to relationship, to love. The love that surpasses understanding. We are witness when those who are sick are cared for, are caring. When the sick fail to ask for, but rather in community ask what they can do to help. What is that? What is that love? And call to keep loving. To celebrate the beauty of those who gather around and love beyond all telling of it as we have been taught by God to love. Paul says whatever is true, whatever is honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, Excellent. Dwell in those things. Think about those things. Share those things in your community and be grateful. Dwell there and the peace of God will be with you. The other lectionary reading this week comes from Luke. It's a parable you all might be familiar with. Jesus walked to the border of Samaria and Galilee. And along the border, he comes across ten lepers, ostracized from their community. The sick are pushed to the edge and out of town so that nobody else can track it. And their families would approach from a distance and leave some food and take off. It's a quarantine. And they are rejected. And Jesus, walking along the border, comes across this colony of ten lepers. And he heals them. And immediately they run off, go back home to celebrate with family. They go back ecstatic. And as they're running, one man stops. One of ten. He didn't run home, but stopped and turned around. He went back. 
back to thank the one who had saved him. But there was one of ten who were witness. One man out of ten who turned back and fell at Jesus' feet to give praise to what was just and excellent. One who was other. See, this man was with any man of the ten. He was a Samaritan. He was the one who was outside of the other nine. He was the one who shouldn't have come back. And he was the only one who did. He turned around to give praise to say thank you. And he was the one who lived across the border, the one who was not of them, but of Samaria, who belonged to those who worshipped the wrong God. He was a man from the edge, from the border, unlike the familiar center. When I was going to Edmonton a few weeks ago, there was a rabbi who presented at a conference, and she talked about Leviticus. She talked about the high holy day of Yom Kippur that the Jewish people are celebrating this week. It is a day of atonement. And what was beautiful about her story is that on Yom Kippur, the Jewish people offer confession. And they're put into the scapegoat, and the rabbi lays his hands on the goat, and they send it out into the wilderness. They send out these confessions, and God takes them away through this goat. It's a whole process, and I encourage you to look it up, because it's such a beautiful ritual. But the point of her story was that God doesn't happen in a center. God doesn't happen in this place fully where we know God to be. Rather, to see God, we go to the edges. We go out into the wilderness, into the unexpected, and start to see different things. We don't meet the new here, but out there. And started to turn in my head, and I thought, it was kind of like a diamond. That diamond in the rough, this one out of ten men. When in a group of ten, he looks just like the other ones, he looks like any other stone. But there is one man that turns around, and for a moment, there is a glint of something special. A glimpse of where a rock has been polished and a glimpse of light that can then be reflected. It's a glimpse. The momentary refraction of a light. Something so beautiful that captures our attention, yet so fleeting we can't bear to look at it for more than a second. the most beautiful thing we have ever seen, it captures us. But on the outside, we would pass it by. The investment of care, of cut, of polish, slowly starts to work away at that rock and it becomes something different at the edges. These experiences of life the things we celebrate, where has life made us what we are? So often we don't recognize in other people all the stuff that life puts on us, all that pressure over time, all the stuff that we go through, all the suffering and strife and love and experience. And yet the whole time it's working away on the inside, making something different, calling us to be something. We are growing in it. And we keep doing these things that we've learned and seen and heard, but it isn't the center where we meet the light. Diamonds in the dark are nothing. They don't 
sparkle. They don't emit light themselves. I saw something funny, some sort of fact to me about diamonds shining. Shine like a diamond. Diamonds don't shine. They reflect. We, diamonds can only reflect and sparkle the light that is allowed into them. The more we polish and cut and trim and work, the more we can reflect that light. It isn't the center of us where the light reveals what we are, the potential of what we can become, but rather the unpolished edge that border where we find the unexpected. Those places where we are forced to press on. Those places where the light can get in and reveal the gem inside. The place where the peace of God lies. Amen. Let's try to get in number 215. Rejoice, the Lord is king. <laughs> Gracias. 